the call, conflict, and collapse of Jeroboam, king of the ten northern tribes of Israel. Again, the call, conflict, and collapse. We're dealing with 1 Kings chapter 13, verses 1 through 10, which is primarily the conflict and collapse. His call was slightly earlier. A little background. In 1 Kings chapter 9, we see the dedication prayer of Solomon after building the first ever beautiful gold inlaid temple. In 1 Kings chapter 10, it's a description of the greatness, wealth, and wisdom of Solomon. In chapter 11, is the tragic account of Solomon allowing strange women into his life, and worse, becoming estranged from the living God who installed him there in his father David's place with the iniquity of idolatry, thanks to the strange women that he allowed into his life. In chapter 11, verse 28, Jeroboam is introduced as a mighty man of valor, a powerful, well-acclaimed and acknowledged man in Israel. And Solomon actually promotes Jeroboam to a position of honor. And then in chapter 11 of 1 Kings, verse 29, a certain prophet named Ahiah, remember that name, Ahiah, A-H-I-J-A-H, he meets Jeroboam, and Ahiah is wearing a brand new cloak. He takes off that cloak, rips it into 12 pieces, gives 10 to Jeroboam and keeps two. He says, this is to signify that you will become king of the 10 northern tribes of Israel, but the remaining two will remain under Solomon's son, who is Rehoboam. By the way, we covered this historical background in a message titled, It is Too Much to Go Up to Jerusalem. I would encourage you to check that message out. This kind of follows on its heels. So this is a tremendous and incredible prophetic picture from the prophet Ahiah to Jeroboam, giving him 10 of the 12 pieces of this new cloak. And that's when Israel becomes a divided nation or a divided kingdom. For David's sake, those two southern tribes will stay with his son Rehoboam. And there's a tremendous prophecy given to Jeroboam by the prophet Ahiah, in verse 38 of chapter 11, 1 Kings, I will read it. Ahiah says to Jeroboam, way before he becomes king, if you will listen to all I command you and walk in my ways, that's in God's ways, and do right in God's sight, keep my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did, then I will be with you and build you a sure house as I built for David and will give Israel to you. Jeroboam was promised dynastic succession and a sure household if he would obey and follow the Lord God Almighty, through whose servant Ahiah this prophecy is given to him. In chapter 12, after Solomon first uh, brings Jeroboam into a position of power in chapter 11, in chapter 12, he sees Jeroboam becoming very strong. So he seeks Jeroboam's life, but Jeroboam flees to Egypt to stay safe. Then Solomon dies, and Rehoboam, his son, becomes king. Again, I encourage you to check out the previous upload title, It Is Too Much to Go Up to Jerusalem. So Rehoboam, Solomon's son, becomes king. He takes foolish advice of the young friends of his instead of the elders in the kingdom of of his father David. So the ten northern tribes rebel against Rehoboam and they make Jeroboam king, thus vindicating and fulfilling the prophetic word over Jeroboam by the prophet Ahiah. Ahiah. Now we see sadly the backsliding of Jeroboam after such a wonderful promise I just read to you, 1 Kings 11.38. After such a wonderful promise from God, he backslides. He falls again into the same iniquity of idolatry. We have shared a few times. There's sin, transgression, and iniquity. 
Sin is something as simple as stealing a cookie. Transgression is like deliberately flouting the law and speeding when you know what the speed limit is. But iniquity is doing something abominable like worshipping idols, like living a lifestyle of sexual immorality. That is iniquity. And so Jeroboam falls into the iniquity of idolatry. He builds two golden calves. It puts one up in Dan and the second south in Bethel so that the people will not cross the border to go into the to Jerusalem and the southern kingdom for the annual feast. Also, something else Jeroboam does, which is not seen elsewhere in scripture. God had, through Moses, instituted that the priests would only come from the tribe of Levi, would be Levites. Jeroboam deliberately flouts that and flaunts himself in, 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 in having non-Levites in making and accepting deliberately non-Levites to be priests but over the idol worship. Our text now is 1 Kings chapter 13 1 through 10. If you have your Bibles please follow through. We need to save time and get through the, the message here. Please follow through there. It just says a man of God verse 1. A man of God. I love this because his, even his name is not given. This is just another man of God. Oh, we are in for some amazing surprises in heaven. We think, oh, such and such, this name was a mighty man or woman of God. You just watch when we get to heaven. Wow. We'll say, what? I didn't know this person had such an intimate relationship with God. I did not know this person led that many souls to Christ. I did not know this person had such an incredible impact on their community. Just a man of God, unknown, unnamed man of God, a very simple but powerful designation. It was He was never called, as we hear sometimes today, God's man of the hour. Oh, I, I abhor those titles. No one is God's man of the hour except the Lord Jesus Christ. He always was and always will be God's man of the hour. The only one worthy of such adulation and praise. This was just a man of God, unnamed. Thank God for men and women of God like this. We must be careful to always give God the glory. We are simply called to be his servants on this earth in this life. Now, this man of God had a twofold mission. After Jeroboam, with a mighty prophecy earlier that was fulfilled, he becomes king. Now, in 1 Kings 13, he backslides, he installs idols, he uh, initiates or, or puts uh, non Levites in positions of priesthood. This man of God has a twofold pronouncement. Number one, he administers to King Jeroboam a stinging rebuke. And number two, he pronounces the doom of Jeroboam and basically the end of his uh, kingship. There will be no dynasty for him. Jeroboam, after instituting this abominable perversion of idols, which we see in chapter 12, he now comes to sacrifice incense on the altar before the golden calf that he has had placed in Bethel, in the southern part of the kingdom of Israel. The man of God comes straight up to King Jeroboam. He rebukes him to his face. He rebukes the king. How bold is God's messenger? He is not afraid to hurt the king's pride. He could care less for the wealth, power, or influence of the king. Hear me, friend. Those who go on God's errands must not fear. They must not fear men. For they know that God will bear them out. The message is not whispered in quiet, secretly, one on one. Even as Jeroboam was uh, performing this iniquity in the sight of all Israel, the rebuke from God through his man was in the face of the king, in front of the false priests and idols, in front of the face of Israel. The prophet says, Thus says the Lord. This prophecy was literally pronounced upon the stones of that altar that Jeroboam was going to perform sacrifice. 
Listen to this statement. If God's anger or wrath will fall upon the stones of an altar, how much more upon the worshippers? How will they escape? The prophecy was that that altar would be smashed, broken, torn down. Second, ashes, the very ashes on the altar would be poured out. And third, and this is incredible, in verse 2 of chapter 13, the man cried against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, Altar, altar, the prophecy was against the inanimate altar made of stones. Thus says the Lord, a son will be born in the house of David, Josiah by name. Josiah was the boy king who had a heart after God, who was made coronated king of Israel at the tender age of eight years. And it's prophesied a couple of hundred years before his birth, there will be a king, Josiah by name, from the house of David. And on you, on this altar, he will burn the bones of the priests that are performing this iniquitous sacrifice. How incredible and how specific is that prophecy by this unknown man of God? 356 years later, to be precise, 356 years later, you see it recorded in 2 Kings, this is 1 Kings, 2 Kings, Chapter 23, verses 15 through 20. You're welcome to read that. There's a perfect fulfillment. You know, I thought personally that I was pretty tough against icons and idols and paintings and pictures of these pagan deities. But Josiah, the boy king, as he grew up, you know what he did? He had the bones of those false prophets exhumed and those bones were burned on the same altar. Wow! And how it pleased God. By the way, you say 356 years later, dear friend, for with the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. But Jesus said, my word shall never pass away. What was prophesied by this unknown man of God was accurately fulfilled 356 years later by the king named Josiah. Instead of trembling with fear at the message when the unknown man of God pronounced this to Jeroboam the king, instead of trembling with fear, he put out his hand against God's messenger in an attempt to assault him physically. And he said, catch him, grab him. This was in defiance of God's wrath and anger and in contempt of God's grace. Immediately, you know what happened to Josiah's hand? It withered up. It became limp and wasted and useless instantly. Wow! Oh, to see the power of God in action like that again in our day and age and time. And secondly, while his hand withered up, the altar broke down by the supernatural power of God and the ashes from it poured out. Both happened simultaneously. It was rent and the ashes poured out. The hallmark or proof of a prophet, a true blue prophet of God, is that the word of God will be confirmed with signs and wonders following. You can read that in Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 20. The altar was rent, the stones break and crumble and fall and the ashes pour out by the power of the invisible hand of God. This was a reproach, a slap in the face to the king right in front of his people and the false prophets. In fact, it was a, it's a pity that the heart of the king and the people, that's the priest, the, the, the prince, the priest and the people, their hearts were harder than the very stones that had just crumbled. What a tragedy. Proverbs 9 verses 7 and 8 says, You rebuke a, rebuke a sinner, he will hate you. And he will try to do you mischief, harm, if he can. This is the unrepentant sinner. And so was Jeroboam, these false priests and these idolatrous people. But God, 
who employs his servants, who calls his servants into the ministry, will see fit to protect them and to guard them. Many people don't like hearing the truth and to have their sins revealed. Rather, we would have and hear deceitful words of flattery. We prefer friends who praise us in the front and tear us down behind our backs or stab us in the back. Jeroboam, as the king of the northern kingdom of Israel, was no exception. He stretched out his hand against the servant and prophet of God. Psalm 105 verse 15 and Second Chronicles 20 verse 20 have the same uh, verse basically saying, Do not touch my prophets and do not harm my servants. Jeroboam violated that and his hand instantly withered. Immediately, his hand becomes limp and dry and wasted. God will protect his children and vindicate his name in his time and for his glory. Sometimes it may be slow, but it is sure. Suddenly now, Jeroboam sings another tune. His sin is turned to shame. His haughtiness is changed to humility. That which would have pricked his conscience, the prophecy, that didn't humble him. But that which touched his flesh and bone did. Now he looks, listen to this, he does not look to that dumb golden calf idol. He does not look to his false prophets. He turns to the prophet of God. In his time and in his moment of affliction, he turns to the God of Israel for healing. When his hands were stretched forth to burn incense to those golden calves, it did not dry up. But when he reached out against the prophet of God, he will never be able to use that hand again until he repents and humbles himself. Now, it is not his evil incense, but the holy incense of the prayer of the man of God that the only restoration for his hand. When God wounds, when God wounds, no hand but his can make it whole again. I'll say that again. When God wounds, no hand but his can make whole again. Many times, to bring this to our day and age, people want to sit and listen in church or to a message or to a pastor or preaching and teaching and criticize, speak ill of the men and women of God so glibly, but yet when we are sick and dying, we send for the same pastor and minister to pray for our healing and wellness. The time will come when those who hate the preaching, they don't want to accept the truth, that they will be glad for the prayer of those same faithful ministers. Jeroboam now looks at the prophet and pleads with him to intercede to God for the healing of his withered hand. Notice he doesn't ask for pardon from sin. He is an unrepentant man. It has nothing to do with turning away from idolatry. It's just please pray to God to heal my hand. Just like Pharaoh said to Moses, pray to your God to stop this plague when his son died. But he never repented of the evil in his heart. Pharaoh never did. No difference with Jeroboam. Pray for healing of my hand, not for pardon of my sin. There was no change of heart. Just restore my hand to normalcy. The prophet, in the true spirit of a servant of God, forgives and rewards evil for good. Jeroboam now, with his hand back to normal, he's happy again. He asked the prophet, understandably so, please come to my house, refresh yourself, I will give you a reward. It would have been a great privilege and honor for the prophet to accept the hospitality of the king of Israel. Surely he would have been hungry and he could have done with good clothes and a good amount of money as reward. He was probably not a rich man. We could almost say he would have been a very simple uh, man, a, a poor man living a simple lifestyle. There was a twofold purpose in this invitation from King Jeroboam to the prophet. One, 
It's like an apology for trying to arrest you. And two, to hopefully soften the judgment of God that was pronounced against him by the prophet. In reply, this unknown man of God says, Even if you will give me half your house, you got to read these verses 1 through 10 of First Kings chapter 13. Even if you give me half your house, I will not go in with you. Forget it. I'm not coming to your house. Sorry. If he had to eat and drink with the king, it would have implied either that God maybe would avert the disaster or secondly, it could have showed that maybe at least there would be a mitigation, a mitigation of the divine wrath of God's judgment. Therefore, the prophet returns and goes back away from Bethel, back to his house by a different route, a different way, exactly as God commanded him to do. The prophet showed implicit obedience to the command of God to him. And then in verses 33 and 34 of this chapter, we come to a tragic ending of this teaching. We read, after this thing, Jeroboam, would you believe, did not turn from his evil ways, but he continued to appoint priests who are not Levites for the same high places where he had the golden calves, altars. Whoever he wanted to, he would consecrate them as priests. And verse 34, hear this indictment. And this thing became the sin of the dynasty. Remember the word dynasty of Jeroboam that caused it, his dynasty, to be abolished and destroyed from the face of the earth. And we'll see that in the next lesson. This became an abomination. He returned to his idolatrous ways, made non-Levite priests flying in the face of God, continued to keep those golden calf idols. He insisted on violating God's law repeatedly. How different is this? Similarly, in many churches today, there's sadly a lack of sanctified men as ministers of the gospel of our God and his word. There are pastors and priests who are taken up. Hear me, friend, if you're in ministry. There's many a pastor and priest who've been taken up by the pleasures of this world. Those have become idols in their lives. They are caught up in sensual habits, licentious lifestyles materialistic indulgences and self-aggrandizement. Let me state those again. There are many ministers around the world claiming, posing as ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ who are caught up in sensu sensual habits, licentious lifestyles, materialistic indulgences and self-aggrandizement. And you know what the word of God says at the end of this passage? And this thing became sin. May we be so careful as people who claim to be called by God into his service as ministers. And this thing that Jeroboam did became sin. Next session will deal with the follow-on and the demolition of Jeroboam's dynasty. God bless you.